any tank sitting below ground, but maybe on a cement floor, like the tanks I just explained to you a minute ago, would be exempt. Any other tanks that hold rainwater or a cistern or a septic tank, those two are exempt. So what you see literally is they're not going after the gas stations. They went after virtually everybody, but then they exempted so many things. Who's left? The gas, the gas companies. It's like saying, I'm gonna select all of you guys to, to be a volunteer but I'm going to include you and you and you and you and you and you and it only leaves you left. <clears throat> so they didn't say, hey, we're going after gas companies, but oh, we're going after everybody, but we're exempting all of these people and the only ones left, guess who? All right, so that's what they were trying to get. And I don't know, once again, you guys may be still too young. In that 99, 2000 timeframe, there was called the big tank yank. All of the gas stations, took up their storage, their underground storage tanks that were steel that had corroded and leaked into the soil and had to replace them with that, uh, what's a PC, not, I always wanna say PCBs, but it's not, those uh, pipes, you know, those plastic looking pipes, they would make tanks out of them, PVC, that's it, PVC tanks, so that they would not, corrode and rust and break open. So almost all the gas stations since 99 now use PVC tanks instead of the old steel drums when they were installed because of these rules. Okay. If they had waste, they literally would have to take it to a waste disposal site. And the waste disposal site literally looks like this. It was nothing more than a big hole in the ground. And that would be called, they would call those a tomb. And that tomb would be lined with a lining like clay or that real thick fist queen sheeting, something as a barrier. And then they would load in all of the stuff into there. And we used to call these the dump or the landfill. And then they would put another layer of that clay and that was called a cap. And then over that, they would lay grass or sod. And then over that, they usually would do what? Put a golf course on it. No. They would lay the sod and the grass so that they would cover that tomb up once it got full, but you couldn't build on it. So you couldn't use it for housing because of that stuff in the ground. They did literally use it for golf courses and play and playgrounds and things like that. Twin Bridges out in Danville, Indiana is Waste Management's golf course. It's a private golf course. It literally is built on crap, literally, all right? They filled up all that land and then they capped it off, and then they built a really nice golf course. Duffer Golf Park, same thing. There's a park, uh, they can put swings on it and have a picnic area because the grass is really nice, but it's over the top of those tombs after they would close one. They would open one, make it really big, put a bunch of junk in it, cap it off, and then put grass over the top of it to create that uh, landfill. Now, a brownfield, and this is mainly what I did for the corporate property. So I can explain this a lot easier. A brownfield is an old abandoned industrial building where they left the chemicals there. Company closed, still had a bunch of chemicals on site, so what happened was the government decided to step in and clean these up under the Brownfield law. And they said, hey, we're going to clean up all of these 
old abandoned industrial sites so that the chemicals would not be harmful to the environment. Well, they went in front of Congress and they asked for a bunch of money and it's called the uh, Comprehensive Environmental Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, C-E-R-C-L-A, CERCLA. In your book, write the word Superfund, Superfund. In 1980, they asked for money to clean up these brownfields that were on the NPL called the National Priorities List. So they went to Congress and they got like $8 billion. At that time, that number was so big that it got nicknamed Superfund. Think about that, 8 billion. There are 300 people in 3,000 people in the United States that are worth more than that today. But it was such a big number in 1980 when it was created, they nicknamed it Superfund. And what Superfund did was take that money and clean up all of the brownfields and abandoned industrial sites that were left to the environment. But Superfund said, we will gain our money back by going after the PRPs, the PERPs the potentially responsible parties. We will pay for the cleanup, but we're going to go after the people that created the mess and sue them and try and get our money back. Now, it's a real easy game to win. Any game in the world is easy for you to win if you get to change the rules when it's your turn to play which is literally what CERCLA did. They in instituted three new rules on who was considered a PERP. Who are the potentially responsible parties? Well, they defined it by having three liabilities. If, all right, and here's the fun part. The first liability they created was called strict liability. Meaning, if you own the land at any point in the, that land's history, you created the problem. You are strictly responsible for it. If you ever owned it, you're strictly responsible. We're coming after you. The second liability they created was joint and several. Now, remember the word several means one person, like when you own a property in severalty. So what this second liability says, we can go after as many people as we want, either as a joint lawsuit or go after one person severally. And then here's the third one, which is the super big kick in the ding ding, is that it is retroactive if you ever owned this property you are strictly liable and we are going to sue you either in combination with others under jointly or we may go after you individually under several lawsuits so think about this if you owned this gas station corner that is subject to an environmental cleanup or this old brownfield, let's say it that way. And you owned it for four days in 1957. They're still coming after you. You strictly did it, joint and several, and it's retroactive to everybody that's ever owned this property. This was the laws they had created to gain back all of the money that they were going to pay out. And Shauna, I see your face and i that's what I'm telling you. It's real easy to win when you get to change the rules. And they said, hey, we're gonna go after the perps, the people that did this. Then they changed 
who did it and they changed it to fit this. Everybody did it strictly. We're going after everybody, joint several, and we're going, even if you owned it 20 years ago, we're coming after you. All right, so they made these three laws to recoup the money from these potentially responsible parties. Well, here's the problem. They blow through $8 billion really quick. And they have to go back to Congress and ask for more money. And what is given to them is this thing called SARA at the top of the next page. It is called the Superfund Amendment and Reauthorization Act. So the amendment portion should tell you that they amended something, all right? And it's called Sarah Superfund because CERCLA was nicknamed Superfund. That's why it's, it's called Superfund Amendment and Reauthorization Act. Do you guys see the movie Stripes? In the movie Stripes, the one guy says, you call me Francis, I'll kill you. You touch my stuff, I'll kill you. The first thing the drill sergeant says to the guy is what? Lighten up, Francis. All right. This is literally what Sarah told CERCLA. In the amendment part, Sarah said, okay, we will give you more money, but you need to lighten up on who is considered a potentially responsible party. Those three liabilities are too tough. So Sarah gave CERCLA more money, but they added a condition to it, which is called the Innocent Landowner Act. So Sarah's big claim to fame is that this law brought into this thing called the Innocent Landowner Act. If a owner of the property could prove that they did not create that mess or that they were lied to when they bought it, meaning somebody said, oh, no, there's no environmental issue, and they bought it, or if the documents were forged that showed it was cleaned up, that person could exercise the Innocent Landowner Act and go, I want out of this lawsuit because there's no way I should be involved, all right? So for instance, <clears throat> here's a very easy example. This gas station or this brownfield sells the property to Shauna who opens a flower shop and that's all you sell is flowers. Well, they come after you and go, hey dude, you own the property, you're liable under CERCLA. You could may be able to claim innocent landowner and go, hey, wait a minute. There ain't no way my roses and tulips contaminated this soil. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I can prove that I didn't cause this problem. We parked on the other lot. I only have water here. I don't have any petroleum, no straight eight, anything. You could exercise that Innocent Landowner Act and remove yourself from the lawsuit. Now, if you opened Shauna's Flower Shop and Small Engine Repair, it's a good combination, but then they could literally say, well, you had small engines on your, and you worked on them, you may have added to this, all right? So that's what I'm saying. You have to prove that you didn't do it, or if someone said, hey, it was clean, and you bought it under false pretenses, you could claim this Innocent Landowner Act. Other than that, you could get sucked up into a lawsuit from Sarah and CERCLA to help clean up that brownfield. 